Secretary of State under Presidents Nixon and Ford, Henry Kissinger was a master of real politique, cold, calculating. Or was he? With us today, the author of a new biography, Kissinger, the Idealist. Neil Ferguson on Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Neil Ferguson has taught at Oxford, Cambridge, the Stern School of Business, the London School of Economics, and elsewhere. Professor Ferguson is currently a professor of history at Harvard. Beginning next year, he will become a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution here at Stanford. Author of a dozen major works on economics, military history, and diplomacy, Professor Ferguson has just published the first volume of his biography of Henry Kissinger, Kissinger. 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. Neil Ferguson, welcome. It's nice to be here, Peter. All right, in brief, defend your subtitle. Henry Kissinger, Idealist. It does sound as if I'm being contrarian just for the sake of it, but in fact, almost as soon as I began reading through his private papers, which are at the core of this volume, I began to see that my assumptions uh, were quite wrong. I thought I was going to write a book called something like American Machiavelli, mm. or maybe American Bismarck, uh, because that's what I'd been led to expect by previous books. On close inspection, Kissinger, at least the young Kissinger, turned out not to be a realist at all. In fact, he clashed with Hans Morgenthau, the arch-realist of the 1960s. And as I delved into his development, I realized, one, that he had seen the appeasers of the 1930s as realists, and that was certainly no compliment given what he'd experienced in the 1930s and 1940s. Two, he immersed himself in the work of Immanuel Kant when he was at Harvard. And three, he became a committed opponent of all materialist theories of history, including Marxism and Leninism, while he was a graduate student. So he was an idealist in at least three senses. And in, in that regard, this is not a contrarian subtitle. I think it gets at the very heart of the matter. Uh, a couple of whys to get out of the way. Henry Kissinger himself has written three volumes that could be considered autobiography and half a dozen other volumes in which he unfolds his thinking. Uh, and he's the sub subject of dozens of other works. Why another biography of Henry Kissinger? This is a book in two halves. Uh, this first half stops at the moment he walks into the White House to start working as Richard Nixon's national security advisor in January 1969. His memoirs cover the period pretty much after that. So right. there's very, very little about Kissinger's, not just his early life, the first half of his life. Because the first half of his life, really right down until he was 46, uh, was an academic life, uh, in large measure, the life of an intellectual, of a professor at Harvard. But before that, there's an even more interesting life, life as a soldier, and before that, mm. life as a refugee. So most of what is in this book, uh, covering that period of his life from 1923 to 1968, is pretty much unknown, and nobody previously had access to the papers that cover that time. All right, so one more question on the whys. Personal to you, you've written, as I said, a dozen big books on economics, diplomacy. Your, I think it's your breakthrough book in career terms on the, sec on the First World War. Why is Henry Kissinger, how long did this first volume alone take? 10 years. All right. I did a few things along the way. Along the way. And then the second volume has yet to be written. I assume the filing cabinets have taken shape, but there, you have another year or two at least in this project? Uh, probably three more years. All right. Why is this man worth over a decade of your life? I've written two kinds of, of book in my career. Those that are works of synthesis, uh, trying to write overarching uh, books based on the researches of others, like The Pity of War, the book that you mentioned, or The Ascent of Money, that financial history of the world that I wrote a few years ago. The other kind of book is, is the book that's based on deep primary archival research, like my history of the Rothschild family. Right. Those are the hard ones to write, and I have to say, I'm prejudiced towards them because those are the really big contributions to scholarship if you get them right. And I had been spoiling to write another book on the scale of the Rothschild book when the idea of a biography of Henry Kissinger came along. It was his idea, full disclosure, uh, and I initially said no, because I thought it would be too difficult. I thought there would be way too much stuff. And I also thought that Christopher Hitchens would be beastly to me if I did it. Well, that wasn't 
really off-putting, but it seemed a daunting task. And then I thought, what other book could I, now that I've moved to the United States, mm. take on that is about a major American subject? Unlike most major American subjects, this one has his roots in a German-Jewish milieu that I know pretty well from previous research. And so it suddenly hit me that there were few better American subjects I could take on uh, credibly. And at the same time, I was dead curious to understand better the Cold War. I've done a lot of work on the First World War and the Second World War, and the Cold War starts to loom larger in my imagination as a subject for proper historical study. We're far enough away from it now that I think we can do that. All right. You write about this, in the epilogue, you call this book An Education in Five Stages. This is television. We're going to have to skip and hop through this. I don't even know if we'll get to all five stages, but surely stage one, Germany, the United States, back to Germany. The young Heinz Kissinger in first. Tell us how this family, give us a bit about what his upbringing is like and then get him to the United States. Furt is uh, a rather ugly town next door to Nuremberg in South Germany, Franconia. And uh, Heinz Kissinger, as he was originally known, was born there in 1923 in the midst of the chaos of the German hyperinflation. Uh, by the time he was uh, in his teens, Hitler had come to power and being next door to Nuremberg was being next door to one of the hotbeds of Nazism. Uh, the family uh, got out in the nick of time. His father was a school teacher, deeply devout, orthodox Jew, but also somebody immersed in German Kultur. Uh, the mother was the one with the vim and vigor and she had the nous to know that they had to bail. Uh, and they left in 1938, uh, just months before the Kristallnacht so, pogrom. So what, what is it about the Kissinger, Kissinger family? Lots didn't leave. Right. Lots simply couldn't believe what they were seeing and discounted what they were hearing. Oh, that's just a politician. He's saying it because he has to. Why did they leave? Well, one, you needed to have somebody to vouch for you in order to get onto the quota of refugees that the United States would admit uh, from Germany. And luckily, uh, Kissinger's mother had a relative, a distant one, but one she knew well enough uh, to vouch for them. Uh, secondly, I think his mother was somebody who understood very well uh, the risks that they were running. Probably her husband was more hesitant because he was more emotionally invested in Germany and in his status uh, as a teacher in the secondary school, which was a high status civil servant like role mm -hmm. in the Germany of those days. Uh, so I think it was the mother who said, we've got to leave. Uh, and, and they were lucky because uh, at least a dozen, probably more than a dozen members of the family stayed and died in the Holocaust, including Kissinger's own grandmother, Fanny Stern. Neil, they come to the United States, they live in on the northern end of Manhattan Island, and this, I suppose I should have known this, but I simply didn't. One thinks of Henry Kissinger as the full-blown intellect, the early, in my mind, the earliest images of Henry Kissinger, he's striding across Harvard Yard. Not a bit of it. He's a student at CCNY, and he's working nights in a well, tell us about this. He was working nights in a shaving brush. He was working days in a shaving brush factory and working nights to study first in high school and then later on in City College. Uh, yeah, he's a refugee. And they came with next to nothing uh, and joined a great many other people in Washington Heights who'd, who'd fled. So uh, if we the stop the Reich. film right there and you have young Henry Kissinger, a recent, recent immigrant to this country, uh, like tens of thousands of other Jewish exiles from Germany, Stop the film at that moment. Is there anything to suggest that by the time he's 45, he'll be about to become one of the most powerful men in the world, assisting Richard Nixon? Absolutely nothing. Okay. And in that sense, this is an American dream story in itself because he's 16. He's struggling to learn English. He's struggling to learn baseball. Soccer had been his game. He'd been a keen soccer fan in Germany. He has to adapt. Uh, but he adapts with astonishing speed, so fast that, yes, he can dream of becoming an accountant. And that's the aspiration when once again history intervenes and deals him another card. Uh, he's conscripted, he's called up and, and joins the US Army, becomes a citizen as so many uh, people did in that time, uh, and becomes an American 
uh, as a result of army training. So this is the other great transformative moment in the young man's life. He finds himself catapulted back across the Atlantic and finds himself back on German soil just six years after he'd left in late 1944, facing the Siegfried line as, as a rifleman. Uh, so this is an extraordinary uh, aspect of Kissinger's life that most people have never given uh, any thought to. He's a thin, I plead a guilty thin last. GI, uh, but a, an obviously bright one who is spotted by another bright GI, Fritz Kramer, another refugee from Nazi Germany, uh, who spots the intellectual potential. And Kramer is the one who plucks him out of being a rifleman and turns him into a counterintelligence agent. Pretty luckily, because uh, the uh, mortality rate for riflemen at that time, uh, as you run up to the Battle of the Bulge, was very high. Uh, he was still pretty near the front line, uh, but less exposed than the guys uh, who were really uh, doing the fighting. Uh, and this is an extraordinary sequence of events, very well documented, because Kissinger wrote a good deal about it at the time and wrote back to his parents pretty regularly. So we have somebody who's, by the age of, he's still in his early 20s, as yes. I recall, he has, he's a conscious that he's lost a large part of his family to the Holocaust. He's seen combat. Yeah. That's, actually, that's confirmed. He actually right. sees combat. And then he remains in Germany after the war and becomes a, a, a part of the denazification program, right. hunting out former yes. Nazis. He also witnesses the liberation of a concentration camp. That's a searing experience. Uh, before he even knows the fate of his own family, just outside Hanover, they liberate one of the smaller camps at Arlem. And Kissinger sees the Holocaust face to face, meets its victims, and writes an extraordinary little essay about it called The Eternal Jew, which I quote in full in the book, that's absolutely revelatory. Maybe Makes one realize just what an extraordinary trauma he must have undergone. But I use that word trauma with a certain caution. Uh, previous writers have speculated in certain psychobabble terms about what this did to him. We have here his own reflections in letters home to his parents, which are very, very startling. Uh, a couple of really important things happened to him in the war. One was that he lost his religious faith, and this was very hard for his father to take because his father was quite a devout man. And the letters on that subject are absolutely fascinating. Uh, the other thing that really changed him, I think, was that the experience of war altered his outlook on life. Uh, and he wrote back to his parents, very frankly, I'm different and I'm coming back changed. Though he didn't come back immediately. Interestingly, he decided to stay on for longer than he had to right into the summer of 1947 mm -hmm. to try to help this process of transforming Germany from the catastrophe that it was by 1945 into a stable democracy. And that was, I think, the first hint of that idealism that I allude to in the subtitle. When you say that he lost his religious faith, he ceased to be an Orthodox Jew, or he became a, an outright atheist. Where are we on this spectrum, if that's a fair way to put it? He would never and never has to me described himself as an atheist, but he clearly stopped being uh, a, an observant Jew. Right. Um, only subsequently, I think, identified himself uh, as, a, as an ethnic Jew, I think, the, the, the observance of, of Yom Kippur is really all that remains. Um, this was a, a very That's big, not nothing. That's not that's nothing. not nothing, right. right? So he's not an atheist in the sense that somebody who uh, uh, completely broke with all kinds of religious faith might be. Right. Uh, and because he's a reader of Immanuel Kant by the time he gets to Harvard, uh, I think he has a kind of enlightenment view of what is unknowable. Uh, and that's really, I think, where I would loc locate him, uh, in, in the realm of the Enlightenment thinkers of the late 18th century. All right. Come back to, to again, we, we, we have a thousand pages here, a, a life that still isn't over. Harvard. He goes, the war intervening, he goes from a young Jewish immigrant at CCNY, working days in a uh, shaving brush factory, to Harvard College, the oldest institution in this country. He goes into Harvard, and by the time this book ends, he still hasn't left. Undergraduate, doctoral student, a, a young professor. So he must be recognized as brilliant, exceptional. Intel, the intellectual prowess gets recognized. Tell us that story. 
There's a man named William Yandel Elliott that nobody's heard of anymore, who was a kind of rather bombastic Southern professor in the government department, an Anglophile who'd been to Oxford and had read the idealist philosophers there. He was the big influence of Kissinger's early Harvard years. You've got to imagine the scene. Uh, this young man with a rather thick accent comes in and says, I'm your tutee. Uh, and Professor Elliott, who's very busy and would like to be in Washington advising uh, politicians says, oh, go away and read the works of Kant, thinking that'll get rid of him. And Kissinger goes off and reads the works of Kant and in due course writes the longest senior thesis in Harvard's history with the modest title, The Meaning of History. So he made a big intellectual impact. Eliot was impressed uh, and took him under his wing and encouraged him uh, not only to immerse himself in philosophy, but then to study history. And it's important to realize, and it's one of the reasons I decided to write this book, that Henry Kissinger became a historian and his initial contributions as an academic, his doctoral dissertation and first book, a world restored, are works of history. That matters because history, Kissinger's unusual. As, as someone who thinks history really matters, the generation of the early 1950s mm, mm. thought that social science and science would uh, solve the world's problems. He was pretty unusual of that generation in wanting to write a dissertation about the Congress of Vienna. Uh, Congress of Vienna, come back to that in a moment. First, Kant, and again, we're galloping here. But am I correct, is this a fair summary that Kant is important in the education of Henry Kissinger? He's an enlightenment figure, so you get this willingness to stick with rationality, with reason, as far as it will go. But he's a German enlightenment figure, so his, his great work is a critique of pure reason. He follows reason as far as he thinks it can take you, but then he says, there are very, very severe limits in the way that a French Enlightenment figure never would. Yes. Right? He's, there, there's a certain kind of sense of tragedy in Kant. Is that fair? Yes. And I think what's important is what Kissinger takes from his reading of Kant, which is quite idiosyncratic. Kissinger's interested in, in Kant's theory of history and his theory of, of free will, of freedom, if you like. And Kissinger says there's a problem because Kant seems to say in his essay on perpetual peace that the world is on a trajectory that will ultimately lead to perpetual peace. And Kissinger says that's wrong. It can't be so deterministic. There can't be some inevitable course of history if we have true freedom. Uh, and freedom matters a lot to this young man. Uh, and he thinks a great deal about this and comes to the conclusion that that sense of freedom that when we make a choice, it really is an exercise of free will, is the most important idea uh, at the heart of Kant's philosophy. Uh, so I think what you see at this early stage in his career is a preoccupation with the nature of decision making. We are not, Kissinger concludes, bound by some inexorable historical force propelling us forward. We do have something that is an experience uh, of freedom. And this leads him to an important early Cold War insight. Those people who want the Cold War to be a battle between economic yes, systems, right, right. remember he's writing when that is very much in yes. the air, have missed the we point. We cannot produce them. And Khrushchev yeah. says, we will bury you. Yeah. And Kissinger says in his, in his uh, senior thesis, no, 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 we must reject totalitarianism, even if it's economically better, because freedom is more important regardless of economic efficiency. In that sense, he is an idealist who sets himself in opposition not just to Marxism-Leninism, but also to the economic determinist theories in the United States that were being churned out in the universities at that time, theories of growth that tried to reduce the Cold War struggle to a struggle between economic systems. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's so profound because, it, and so, to me, unexpected that by studying Kant, he comes to this profound conclusion that lines him up beautifully with John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. He be, he be, by studying Kant, he becomes deeply American yeah. in his fundamental intellectual outlook. Is that right? I, th I think so, although it's not as if he immersed himself in studying the founding fathers. No, no, that's the surprise This is a kind me. of um, a coincidence, really. But I think his commitment to democracy and individual freedom is, is very sincere. And when it comes to be applied in the realm of foreign policy, which he starts to think about, right. because that's what William Yandel Eliot encourages him to do. Eliot loves Russia off to Washington to do political advising. Once he starts thinking about strategic problems, he tends to approach them with a pretty absolutist view 
that democracy is right, freedom is right, and self-determination is worth fighting for. The United States should stick up for countries that are trying to resist uh, communist takeover. So there's a fairly straightforward transition, I think, from the, the young philosopher through the young historian to the young strategic thinker. And on most of the key issues that crop up in the early Cold War, Kissinger's pressing for idealism and resisting compromise uh, and, and, and grubby deals. There are, well, let's, uh, we just have to touch on a couple of things, but quickly, because I want to get to mm. the Berlin Wall. Kissinger, the idealist. By 1958, I'm just quoting you, Neil, here. By 1958, this is the year in which Henry Kissinger turns 35. By 1958, Henry Kissinger was an intellectual celebrity. All right, we've already talked about the intellectual. 35 years old, still speaking with a heavy accent, a Harvard, how does he become a celebrity? He wrote a book about nuclear strategy Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, published in 1957. And to cut a long story short, he was lucky in his timing because that book came out just as Americans were beginning to fear that the Soviets might catch them up. And it was Sputnik, the Soviet satellite, that really crystallized that fear. Uh, there was also fear that the Soviets were somehow going to close the missile gap and have more nuclear weapons. Right. Uh, that fear made his book a bestseller because it came out at just the moment Americans were ready to contemplate the possibility that the Cold War was going to be a close thing. All right. He attaches himself or becomes attached to Nelson Rockefeller, patrician, unbelievably wealthy man by the standards of those days. Bill, Bill Gates would think of nothing much of it now, but by the standards of those days, essentially permanent governor of New York. I, I grew up in New York. Nelson Rockefeller was elected governor the year before I was born and didn't step down until I was in junior high school. I thought, I thought he was governor by God's grace. In any event, permanent governor of New York. And Henry Kissinger advises Nelson Rockefeller and sticks with him when Nelson Rockefeller tries three different times to run for president and never even gets the GOP nomination, and a shrewd political, a, sh a realist, somebody who really understood history, would have been able to tell for sure by the third time around that it wasn't Nelson's country. Why did Henry Kissinger stick with Nelson Rockefeller? It's a, it's a very fascinating relationship because you have this uh, ambitious, because Kissinger was clearly ambitious, super smart, uh, refugee soldier intellectual, and the playboy of the Northeastern establishment. Uh, and you would have thought that they had nothing in common. Rockefeller's attitude was that he didn't really read books. He was dyslexic, in fact, but he, he could get the people who wrote the books and hire them. And having heard that Kissinger was smart, he essentially added him to his team. And Kissinger, I think, learned the rudiments of American politics uh, in three unsuccessful shots at the Republican nomination. And I think there are two striking things here. One is the content of what Kissinger advised Rockefeller to do. He was normally pushing Rockefeller to take more hawkish lines on foreign policy. The, the line of attack tended to be the incumbent or the rival is soft on Cold War issues. The other interesting thing is, uh, and I think this is key to understanding uh, Kissinger as a young man, that he doesn't jump ship. If he had really been the cynical, realist opportunist of previous works, why would he have stuck around a three-time loser? Why is he still on board, even in 68, when really nobody thinks Rockefeller no. has a prayer? Why is he stuck there in 1964 when the Goldwater riots are cal carrying all before them? And Rockefeller's booed, booed by That's the mass right. at the convention. He was humiliated just up the road here at the Cow Palace right. in 64. Exactly. Right, exactly. Kissinger is there and it frightens the life out of him to see real American conservatives in full cry. So this is important, I think, because it, it tells you that Kissinger's not really that calculating. In fact, on American domestic politics, at least, he's kind of, kind of naive. Mm -hmm. All right. He's advising the Kennedy administration. And we don't have... We just don't have time for the bridge from Rockefeller. He's advising the Kennedy administration. Berlin Wall. Well, that's interesting because he, he switches party, in All right, go ahead. And, and it's important to You've understand to. why. Got to. Yes. Because he can't stand this man, Richard Nixon. And he will not have anything to do with him. When Nixon, after Rockefeller's been knocked out and Nixon is the candidate, says, can I pick your brains? Kissinger invents a trip to Japan just to avoid 
taking the meeting. So he's far more attracted to glamorous John F. Kennedy, even though Kennedy's a Democrat, mm -hmm. and is one of those Harvard professors who joins uh, the court at Camelot, albeit briefly, as a, an advisor in the Kennedy White House. All right. um, Berlin Wall, East Germany's hemorrhaging citizens by 1960, one in five, astonishing thing, one in five East Germans has left for the West, many by the simple, simple expedient, of stepping over the border from East Berlin into West Berlin and getting on a train and leaving the country for the West. Acting in consultation with the Soviets in August 1961, the East Germans wall off West Berlin, and that wall, of course, will stand until November 1989. John Kennedy's response, quote, a wall is a hell of a lot better than a war, close quote. The wall did solve the problem. And Henry Kissinger's response was? He deplored it. One has to remember how close he the- He deplored the wall and the Kennedy administration's exactly. response to the exactly. wall. Exactly, all right. Exactly, and one has to remember that the stakes were pretty high. Uh, this is one of the few occasions when Soviet, Soviet tanks and American tanks faced off right. during the entire Cold War. Uh, it was very crucial to the survival of the East German regime and therefore to the Soviet dominance of Eastern Europe that this hemorrhage be staunched. Now, from Kissinger's point of view, the idealist point of view, the Germans had a right to self-determination. Ultimately, you wanted reunification, and you wanted it to be under a democratic, not a Soviet-controlled system. Uh, and the Berliners did not want to be divided by a wall. So Kissinger took, putting it crudely, the German side, and was appalled that Kennedy had effectively cut a deal uh, that avoided a showdown uh, by allowing the wall to be built. And, and he did allow it. I mean, really, the Americans stood by and watched that wall get built. So Kissinger was a hawk at that point who felt that there'd been a sellout. Uh, he saw Kennedy as the realist, and I think his position was very much that of an idealist. All right. The Road to Vietnam, I'm quoting one of the chapter titles here in Kissinger Idealist. John Kennedy has been assassinated. Lyndon Johnson is president. He has dramatically escalated our involvement in Vietnam. We now have a full-fledged war, hundreds of thousands of American troops over there. Henry Kissinger goes over and does what? Well, he goes on a fact-finding mission. He realized uh, in the early 60s that Vietnam was going to matter more and more. Uh, but unlike some academics who are content to pontificate from their armchairs or their studies, Kissinger felt he should go uh, because he'd never been uh, to Vietnam. He accepted an invitation from the US ambassador in Saigon, Henry Cabot Lodge, and he went around, not just to Saigon itself, but he flew over Viet Cong held uh, territory. He went down to uh, armed bases at the sharp end of the conflict, and he found out to his horror that the war was going horribly wrong. Uh, early on, he'd taken the view that South Vietnam was just like South Korea, a country that you should stick up for. Once he saw what was happening on the ground, took the trouble to go and find that out, he realized that the war was in fact unwinnable, at least unwinnable in the way that the US was this waging. In 1965. In 1965. Right. Uh, and concludes that ultimately there will have to be a negotiated settlement. That is the conclusion that he presents when he goes back uh, and meets with his colleagues at Harvard. I was very stunned by this diary. It was one of the documents I first saw. You want to see that in writing, actually, because oh, it, it has the feel of a retrospective no, no, fabrication. This is, this is an extraordinarily interesting diary, and all the correspondence that was generated by these trips. He made three successive trips uh, to Vietnam, and each time he became more and more convinced that the situation wasn't salvageable, not just because it was a military mess, uh, which it clearly was under Westmoreland's leadership, but also because the South Vietnamese regime was rotten to the core. He spent a lot of time meeting South Vietnamese leaders across the political spectrum, and the more he saw of them, the more he despaired that this state could be could be cobbled together in any way. So I think this is very interesting. It, it runs counter to the view, which has become somewhat of an orthodoxy, that Kissinger liked the Vietnam War so much he wanted to prolong it right, uh, right. under Richard Nixon. No, no, he realized very early on that you had to somehow extricate the United States diplomatically. And he began working on that problem as early as 1967. Which is exactly what I wanted. So from, We've already established strands that lead from volume one to volume two. Will you hurry up and write the damn thing, please? But I've only just finished this one. <laughs> well, get back to work. <laughs> so, a chapter title in, in uh, Kissinger the Idealist, Waiting for Hanoi. 
1967. This is in this book, is the way you've structured the book. This is the fifth and final stage of Henry Kissinger's education. His 1967 attempt to engage in peace talks with the North Vietnamese. Quoting you, Neil Ferguson on Henry Kissinger. So eager was Kissinger to achieve a diplomatic breakthrough. We're talking about Kissinger, the master diplomat. To end the deadlock that seemed to condemn the United States to either an interminable stalemate or a hazardous expansion of the war, that he failed to discern how cynically the North Vietnamese were stringing him along. Close quote. 1967, and Henry Kissinger gets played. How did that happen? Well, he was very keen, after realizing that things had gone badly wrong in, in Vietnam, to establish some channel of communication to Hanoi in order to begin a negotiation. But how did you do that when the North Vietnamese simply seemed unapproachable? There are multiple attempts by the Johnson administration to start a conversation. They go through every conceivable route, through Poland, for example, and none of it works. Kissinger thinks he has the key because, partly for uh, reasons of his academic career, he has friends in the Eastern Bloc through the Pugwash conferences, regular meetings of scientists that brought Soviet and other Eastern Bloc scientists into contact with Western academics, but also through France, where he has friends. And he thinks there's a way of getting this going through my French friends. And two, uh, two Frenchmen are to be the intermediaries uh, to Hanoi who will somehow get this conversation going. The, the North Vietnamese had no intention whatsoever of doing a deal in 1967 because they were preparing for what they thought would be the war-winning Tet Offensive mm. the very next year. So they played along with this because nothing helped to disrupt American politics more than the possibility that there might be peace at hand. And if you could only make it look as if it was the Americans who were to blame for that peace not being achieved, you absolutely sowed dissension uh, in the United States, which by this time was beginning to approach a domestic political boiling point, sufficiently to cause Lyndon Johnson, of course, to throw in the towel and not contest the 1968 election. So Kissinger's right in there, trying to make a breakthrough, which the North Vietnamese have no intention of giving him. He has endless meetings, endless memos, wonderful letters to the North Vietnamese that get delivered. And this rather interesting figure, the North Vietnamese representative uh, in Paris, a man named Bo, really just plays him for a fool leads him down the proverbial garden path. And Kissinger has a real education in the dark arts of diplomacy in 1967-68. A couple of last questions. Kissinger the idealist, I'm quoting you again, Neil. In 45 years, the book takes him to the age of 45, Henry Kissinger had learned much. He had learned the far from simple truth that decision makers have free will. We've discussed that. Though they must exercise it under conditions of uncertainty and that their choices are usually between evils. Close quote. Uncertainty and evils. Explain this. Kissinger has a wonderful insight into the nature of decision making before he even has to make a big decision, uh, when he's still in the academic realm. It's what he calls the problem of conjecture. Uh, you face two somewhat unappealing possibilities. Uh, you can act now to prevent disaster, but in acting, you have some cost. Or you can play for time, kick the can down the road, and just hope that you get lucky and disaster doesn't strike. And many decisions in foreign policy are like that. The difficult thing may succeed in, in preventing disaster, but nobody is ever grateful for your averting a disaster. Nobody ever thanked uh, the Cold War presidents for avoiding Armageddon, which they ultimately did. You don't get rewarded in a democracy for avoiding disaster if you succeed in avoiding it. So this is the central problem of conjecture. The other problem which Kissinger identifies is that you're nearly always being confronted with evils. Not many options that are presented to you as an American decision maker are happily compatible with motherhood, apple pie, and all the other things you've been brought up to revere. Uh, and in that sense, he says, to be a statesman is essentially to be a tragic figure. Because even if you do your job well, well, you won't get much thanks for it. In fact, you may indeed be blamed. And in that sense, I think Henry Kissinger had a very strong intimation in the first half of his life of what lay ahead for him when he himself became a statesman. It's, it's this idealism combined with the tragic sense. Again, I'm, I'm just so struck that he 
comes at it from a completely different, he rejects his, to a large extent, his Judaism. He's certainly not reading Augustine or Aquinas, but he comes right back to a fundamentally Judeo-Christian understanding of reality, that there are sort of transcendent goods to which we, we really must aspire, but we live in a fallen world. Yes, hmm. I think that's right. Last, last question, Neil. I found this immensely moving and terribly surprising, frankly. You quote a letter from a young Henry Kissinger to his parents uh, shortly after the end of the Second World War. Sometimes when I look down our table and see the empty spaces of our good and capable men, the men who should be here, casualties, they're dead. I think of the night Hitler's death was announced. That night we agreed that no matter what happened, no matter who weakened, we would stay to do in our little way what we could to make all previous sacrifices meaningful. Several questions about that. All brief. Am I over reading it or is that a really fun, the, 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 the intellectual brilliance comes later, but this fundamental contact with reality in wartime, loss, loss of his family, loss of friends, and this determined, the kind of loyalty that you see, you see in Nelson Rockefeller, but here, my goodness, I am determined to do what I must. That's a central, I've, I've heard it said over and over again, although I've never been able to find the citation, that Napoleon claimed, if you wish to understand a man, you must know what was happening in the world when he was 21. Huh. This is the young Henry, yeah. is, that, is that just basic to him all the way through the rest of his life? I think so. I, I think to his generation, those who had fought in World War II, the fight against totalitarianism never stopped because the Soviet Union, which he encountered uh, on the banks of the River Elbe, uh, he meets the Red Army, uh, and there's a wonderful description of what they're like uh, that he sends back to his parents. They were the, the new totalitarian enemy. And so there's a pretty seamless transition in Kissinger's life from World War II to World War III. And in the rest of his career, the question is, how do you deal with this totalitarian menace? You're fundamentally committed to freedom. You've seen what total war can do to a country because you've seen the ruins of Germany and you've seen the death camps. So, so what do you do? And that becomes the central problem of his academic career. How do you deal with the nuclear threat? Is there a way of threatening something less than total Armageddon? That's the central question right. of the nuclear weapons book. And how do you engage this revolutionary power to turn it into a more conservative status quo power? That's the objective of what becomes known as detente. Last question of all. We will do what uh, we would stay to do in our little way what we could to make all to make all previous sacrifices meaningful. Now I'm asking you beyond volume two even to Henry Kissinger. You've spent a lot of time with him yes. in writing this book. He's a man in his early 90s. Uh, he's had heart surgery. He's a man in his early 90s. The United States today, 15 Republicans and at least three Democrats contending to become president. Russia rising. China rising, the Middle East in barbaric disarray, and in a number of ways, the United States pulling back. Is this moment what Henry Kissinger and his generation, what would he say? Is this moment what he sacrificed for? Does this moment step, fall in, into that tradition of sacrificing to make previous American sacrifices meaningful? What would his, what would his view be? of the present moment. Kissinger has expressed himself highly critically uh, about the deal with Iran. Uh, and in his most recent book, World Order, he's also cast aspersions on other aspects of US policy. If you think that we face three main threats today, uh, extremist Islam and the chaos that it sows in the Middle East, an increasingly aggressive, if weak Russia, and an increasingly ambitious and rich China, he, I think, would argue that we do not have a coherent strategic response to those threats. And just to illustrate the point, allowing the Russians to become the power brokers over the Syrian civil war is just the kind of thing that Henry Kissinger sought to avoid in the early 1970s. Allowing the Chinese and the Russians to get closer to one another than either is to the United States is the very opposite of the policy that he and Richard Nixon pursued that led to the opening to China in 1972. So one point about writing this biography and really what drew me 
to do it and gets me out of bed in the morning to write volume two is that we need to relearn some of the key insights about grand strategy, about war and peace that Kissinger and other members of his generation learnt the hard way because this generation, the generation that is in power in Washington today, seems largely to have forgotten those lessons. I lied. This is the last question. Was the young Henry Kissinger good company? Did you find yourself liking this young man? I, I think that there were two young Henry Kissingers. The one that people saw at Harvard, who was pretty serious and reserved and spent most of his time working. I mean, I really do identify with the workaholism. But there's another Henry Kissinger that comes out in this book, and that's the soldier, uh, who has a Groucho Marx type sense of humor and can get up to some serious hijinks. And I think those two Henry Kissingers coexisted, but to have fun, I think you needed to see the second one with his dog, Smokey, and his, and his enthusiasm for attractive attractive women. So there's, there's, there's a kind of, there's a mask behind which uh, the professor uh, conceals uh, the GI. Neil Ferguson, author of Henry Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. Thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson.